Well, it's time for another Thursday devotional, and today we continue our series, The Real Monsters. Now, let me remind you about the the purpose of this series. We look at some issue that Christians talk about, something that's going on in contemporary culture. And maybe it's something that Christians uh, get really frightened about or, or angry about, and we look for an opponent that we can battle against, some group of people outside in the world who embodies this perspective, and we hyper-focus on what's going on in our immediate circumstance. But in this series, what we are seeing that is if if you dig down deep, if you, if you drill back behind the surface, what you find is there is a real monster there. There is some set of spiritual dynamics, a, a kind of spiritual warfare that's happening. Something that, in fact, has been affecting the people of God for thousands of years. And we discover that this battle with the real monster isn't just about battle battle with external forces. It's something going on inside of our own hearts and minds. It's something that we have to battle as individual disciples of Jesus Christ. And if we're honest, we can see the temptation, the power of these forces at work in our own hearts. And so that's the idea behind the real monsters. And we've looked at secularism. We've looked at virtue signaling. And last time we we discussed kind of uh, what I called political cults or a cultic approach to politics where we religiously venerate a political figure or we use ideological tests, uh, tests to define Christian orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And we've discussed these things and what we've tried to see is what is the real monster behind it all. And today I want to tackle a subject that lots of people are always talking about in the culture around us, and that's the topic of misinformation or disinformation or whatever they're calling it in the media these days. And this is something that a lot of us worry about. And, you know, think about all the controversial uh, issues of the day. This is being taught in the classrooms. This isn't being taught in the classrooms. Uh, This is uh, some thing I've heard about the vaccine. Here's something that they're lying to you about, about the vaccine. You know, here's something about this uh, political uh, figure. Oh, don't listen to that. That's just Russian uh, interference, disinformation, misinformation. And what should Facebook do about it? And what should YouTube do about it? And on and on and on and on. And it's really, really confusing. Now, we could look at this whole issue, this hyper-focus on misinformation from lots of different angles, and I think it's a fascinating topic, and, you know, I've told uh, the people of this congregation before that I think part of the issue that we're seeing in, uh, you know, in our culture today is we really have an epistemological crisis. We we really don't know how we know things. We we use words like facts and fact-checker, and and honestly, we don't even really know what we're talking about, because if you know anything about the the rise of fact-checkers, often fact Fact checkers get fact checked and I mean it's just a mess and so really we have a kind of an epistemological crisis in our uh, culture and we don't know how to know things right but here's the thing remember this is the real monsters that epistemological crisis is rooted in spiritual crisis and back behind all of this stuff there is a real monster and that real monster is just simply deception the spirit of deception and in particular we have an enemy who wants us to be deceived we have an enemy that wants us to think things which are false are actually true and he he wants us to think that there are things which are true which are actually false and he wants us to be confused and he wants us to be mixed up and he wants us to fight brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. He wants us to to be in wars with our brothers and sisters in Christ based on uh, these falsehood and deceptions. And so we need to go back, we need to see that deception is a persistent problem in, in human life that we can be deceived and that we can be deceivers and that there's a real monster lying back behind all of this talk about myths or dis or whatever information. And that really becomes uh, clear when you go back to the New Testament, for example, the writings of the Apostle Paul, and you talk about the danger of the false gospels that Paul confronts in his day. Paul knew that there was deception at work against the churches of Jesus Christ, against the church of Jesus Christ. And one of the most um, dramatic portrayals of that happens actually in Galatians 
chapter 1, and I just want to uh, go with you to Galatians chapter 1, and we're just going to look at a few verses from Galatians uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, and then actually, actually we'll go to a verse as well from Galatians chapter uh, 3. But for a moment, let's just look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, and remember, we're listening for this problem of deception. Paul says this, he says, I am astonished to find you turning away so quickly from him who called you by grace and following a different gospel. Not that it is, in fact, another gospel, only there are some who unsettle your minds by trying to distort the gospel of Christ. But should anyone, even I myself or an angel from heaven, preach a gospel other than the gospel I preach to you, let him be banned or let him be accursed or let him be anathema, right? I warned you in the past and now I warn you again, if anyone preaches a gospel other than the gospel you received, let him be banned. And later on, Paul says uh, in Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 1, and this is a very strong translation, it's the... Uh, revised English Bible, uh, he says this, he says, you stupid Galatians, you must have been bewitched, you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was openly displayed on the cross. How could you fall for these things? How could you go to this different gospel, in other words? And again, uh, this translation is very strongly worded. It says, you stupid Galatians. In other places, it, it says, uh, you know, you foolish Galatians, that you can sort that issue out on your own. But the point is, is that Paul is deeply concerned about this false gospel that they are, at least some of them are, are toying with or, or coming to believe. And really there are two uh, sides to this issue. There's the problem of the deceivers themselves. And these are the people that Paul says, you know, let them be a curse, let them be uh, cut off, let them be banned, you know. Uh, these, these are people we have to watch out for, you know. These are the wolves that are infiltrating the church. You know, so watch out for the deceivers. But really he's also saying, but don't be deceived. Don't just blame it on the deceivers. You yourself have to take responsibility. You know, don't be foolish. You know, you're astonishing me by your willingness to follow after these teachings. Actually, Paul says something very similar in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. Let me just read to you a few verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I should like you to bear with me in a little foolishness, Paul writes to the Corinthians. Please bear with me. I am jealous for you. With the jealousy of God, for I betrothed you to Christ, thinking to present you as a chaste virgin to her true and only husband. Now I am afraid that as the serpent and his cunning seduced Eve, your thoughts may be corrupted and you may lose your single-hearted devotion to Christ. For if some newcomer proclaims another Jesus, not the Jesus whom you proclaimed, or if you received a spirit different from the spirit already given to you, or a gospel different from the gospel you have already accepted, you put up with that well enough. You put up with that, this, this other gospel, this other presentation of Jesus. Don't be like Eve, in other words. Don't be deceived by a deceiver and then spread deception. It's the same kind of idea that's at work in Galatians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 3. And it's got the same uh, problems, two, two sides to the issue. There's the problem of being deceived. You, you need to not be deceived. You need to take responsibility. And also, you need to avoid the deceivers and don't be a deceiver. Don't fall into falsehood and then present falsehood to others. And so we see here that Paul is contending for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the true message of who Jesus is and what he has done and what he has accomplished for us and for our salvation. And there are competing gospels, call them whatever you want, false gospel, misinformation, a disinformation. They are false and they are dangerous and they lead to damnation and they must be avoided. But Paul counsels these people to to stick to the truth, to stick to the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not be deceived. And what, by the way, lies at the heart of all of this deception? If you go back just a few chapters, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you read this in verse 3, If our gospel is veiled at all, Paul says, it is veiled only for those who are on the way to destruction. Now listen to verse 4, their unbelieving minds 
are so blinded by what he calls the God of this passing age or the God of this world that the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, cannot dawn upon them and bring them light. What is it? It's a blindness caused by our enemy. Do you see how misinformation, disinformation, deception has always been with us? Because we have an enemy. There is a deceiver who wants us to be mixed up and confused. So let me give you a couple practical words as we wrap this video up. The first is this. My old mentor, my first uh, mentor always said, you know, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the orthodox uh, apostolic presentation of who Jesus is and what he has done. That is the main thing. And the main thing is to keep it that way. Let us not be deceived about who Jesus is and what he has done. Let us hold to the true gospel. Let us hold to the teaching of the word of God. And the closer we get to the truth of the Bible, the closer we get to the truth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the less power falsehood has over us. And when we get it right about the main thing, when we get it right about the gospel, I sincerely believe that we gain power to better understand and sift through all the other kinds of information that we find in this world. So that's the first practical word. And the second is this, pursue truth, but don't abandon humility. Don't be deceived, fight against deception, but also know uh, at the end, you're also not going to get everything right. And so there's, there's a need for humility, a need to keep growing, a need to keep learning. And there's really two big reasons that we can't ever get everything right. It's our, fin our finitude and the flesh. You're finite. You can't know everything. You can't be everywhere. You can't do everything. So there's stuff you're going to miss. But also, you are constantly battling the fleshly impulse. You're constantly battling against temptation and sin. And as long as you're engaged in that battle, you will fall prey at times to deception. But the point is, is that we can't give up. We have to keep going. We're not going to be perfect. We have to be humble, but we have to keep moving towards the truth. And our hope is, is that one day we will see. One day we will be with the Lord. We will be with the Lord forever in a renewed creation. As many of our uh, forefathers in the faith have pointed out, we will have this beatific vision. We will, we will know God and see God in a way we cannot know God and see God now. And at that moment, all of the misinformation, all of the disinformation, it will all fall away in the blazing glory of truth. Would you join me in prayer? Father, uh, we thank you for your word. Uh, this world is confusing. There's lots of conflicting accounts, lots of misinformation, but Lord, your word is, is true and it's powerful. And we believe that when it is wielded by your Holy Spirit, that it changes us and transforms us and it has power to change and transform people's lives. Oh God, would you keep up your work of teaching us and showing us the truth. And may the gospel of Jesus Christ spread throughout our community and throughout the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks a lot, and I'll see you soon.